Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done. Yo, y'all, we're back with another episode of the Elliot Host Podcast. And today I have Anthony Johnson, the president of the Manosphere. Anthony, thank you for joining us. Yeah, man. Glad to be here. Appreciate it. Big time. So my first question for you, Anthony, is what is the Manosphere? So the Manosphere is a movement that, in my view, has been going on for more than 25 years at this point. Uh, Some say even since the 80s, men's rights activists and stuff back then got going. Dr. Warren Farrell, for example, you might know him. Mm -hmm. He wrote uh, The Boy Crisis, a book on boys, co-authored it. So the Manosphere, in my view, though, is mainly a movement that got started with the pickup artist community and men's rights in like the 90s. And since then, it's evolved into more and more things over time. And in my view, it's the most important movement alive today. It's the premier movement alive today. That is counterculture, like 100% against everything that is stupid, fake, woke, uh, global homo, feminist, like all this like stupid garbage we deal with today. Kids getting groomed, like the trans stuff, like uh, radical feminism that's like super anti-male, very sexist, like a hate and supremacist movement. So the Manosphere is this collection of men and fathers who are very much in favor of men's issues and men's rights and very opposed to stuff like feminism. And it's a movement that has different groups too. So it's not just like one unified movement, not even close. Kind of like feminism, it's like very loosely organized. There's no like official leaders, even my president title. Mm-hmm. That was like self-declared. Right. Like, it's half real, half gag, mm-hmm. which is kind of what makes it special and like hilarious. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. But for example, in my view, there's four or five like main distinct groups in the manosphere. Uh, one would be like MGTOW. Another would be like Red Pill. Another would be men's rights activism. And the fourth would be like leftovers of the PUA seduction community. Can we break those four down real quick? So, you know, if anybody hears the term manosphere, of course, they want to lump it in with whatever is uh, popular in the day. But you're saying that there are four distinct Even more than that. There's a couple more on top of that, I would say. So those are the four that I used to say. There's two more that I think should be added. One is the black manosphere. Uh, That's like a distinct group on YouTube and on Twitter and stuff. And this is guys like O'Shea Duke Jackson, uh, Obsidian Radio. These are some big channels. Uh, O'Shea has like 300,000 subscribers, I think, at this point. And I call him, I call him like the governor or the president of the Black Manosphere. Um, they're their own group. Like they do interact with and engage with a lot of the wider Manosphere. Uh, but they're like very, very focused on Black men and Black men, issues facing Black men. Um, that one's become more popular in the past couple of years. Yeah. Another one I think would be Tradcons. Uh, traditional conservatives uh, are much have become a much bigger influence in the manosphere the past few years. That'd be guys like Ryan Mickler, maybe yourself, maybe like Tanner Guzzi. And that to me is a distinct wing. And I focus on that with the Patriarch Convention, for example. Right. So there's really like probably five or six groups at this point. Um, I do exclude incels. I don't think people should include incels with the manosphere. I don't think this is accurate. It's not factual. It's okay, what... so you're using a lot of language that people may not be aware of. Right? Yeah. So... Let's stick with that for a moment. What is an incel and why should they not be a part of the manosphere? So an incel, number one, the reason they shouldn't be a part of it is that 
it's usually enemies of the manosphere, people who hate men, people who are just like very explicitly sexist, but they don't want to admit it. They just hate men, they hate fathers, they hate boys. It's all like they just want to uh, blast and, you know, bash men for any kind of authentic masculinity, traditional masculinity, masculinity that's been considered normal for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, like our friend Jeff Younger, for example, going through his uh, father's rights issue right now, trying to save his son from being transitioned into a girl, uh, not only socially with dresses and wigs and shit, but also like uh, chemically castrating him, giving him puberty blockers, yeah. ultimately surgically mutilating him in California under the new trans law, SB 107. Gives us on Tucker Carlson um, like a week ago, not even. Uh, INCEL though, you mentioned like, what is that specifically? INCEL stands for involuntary celibate. Okay. So in the eighties, you would have just called this a nerd, like Revenge of the Nerds, you right. know that movie or one and two, or whatever. How many right, so are. guys that want to have sex with women, but they can't. Yeah, which for most of American history, or at least, you know, in the 70s and 80s and even 90s, you just call that a nerd or a dork or a geek or something. And it, right. it wasn't it wasn't this like really dangerous thing. It's like, oh, he's like a beta male. Okay. Like, oh, he just kind of sucks with girls. That sucks. Right. And that's different than like a, like a voluntary celibate. A vol cell. Yeah, that's a lot different. A vol cell would be guy, a guy who's like super Christian or super Catholic or whatever, and he doesn't want to have sex until marriage. That's different. Uh, if you can uh, bang chicks... If you're, you know, good looking, if you're masculine, whatever, but you choose not to, right? Authentically, As some of these guys, uh, like the MGTOW guys, I've gotten my patience has worn thin with them recently. They've been a lot more combative with me. I'm MGTOW, like, you know, yeah, MGTOW, men, okay. go, men going their own way. And what's that all about? Men going their own way. In my understanding, got started in the 2000s, um, before the manosphere was even like a term. The term manosphere actually came from a feminist uh, blogger. A couple of them. They were looking in 2009, they were looking at like the pickup artist community that was blown up on, they had their own TV shows on VH1. It was a New York Times bestseller of the game, um, stuff like that. And the PUA community was starting to interact with like men's rights. Men's rights activists like usually wouldn't like them, but they'd both have kind of pro men's stances. And so feminists were kind of looking at all this and they were saying like, this is kind of the same content sphere, the same blogosphere. So they called it the manosphere. And that term, I think, is pretty good. It's not perfect. Some people say it sounds like a gay nightclub or something, which right. is kind of funny. You uh, said PUA, so I'm assuming that's pickup artists. artists. Yeah. Okay. So the manosphere began when someone noticed, a, a female blogger noticed, yeah. that the pickup artists and the men's rights activists were starting to merge uh, as a yeah. force. Yeah. What were the men's rights activists uh, activizing about? What's their deal? So MRAs would be guys like Paul Elam. I really wanted to speak at my convention. Um, I'd also even be some women like Janice Fiamengo, Dr. Warren Farrell is another one. Um, another one is, Carl, uh, for example, Carnell Smith out of Georgia, Atlanta, mm -hmm. Georgia. He's spoken at our convention a couple of times now. One of our most popular speakers, which is pretty cool for someone who is relatively unknown. He is someone who successfully fought in like six or seven states now. Uh, he fought to change paternity laws. So he actually got, uh, he basically got like kind of cucked by a woman who lied to him for like 10, 11 years that a kid was his and it wasn't his and she knew yeah. the whole time. Wow. It came out in like text messages and stuff that uh, she was telling her friends like she knew it wasn't the, his kid, but she was collecting child support for like over a decade when he was married to another woman already at that point, right. had more kids. So he was like supporting his own actual biological family and paying child support for over 10 years. Then he found out it wasn't his kid through paternity testing, DNA testing. He, obviously, he was pissed off, right? Yeah. Not only because he was lied to, but because he got financially defrauded for over a decade. And due to state laws in Georgia and most states as well, he couldn't do shit about it. Absolute financial fraud. She defrauded him and knew yeah. it the whole time. That's criminal. Yeah. Well, but according to the law back then in the 2000s, he ended up going like on Dr. Phil and like a lot of TV shows and stuff because this was a big thing. And it really pissed him off. So he ended up going to be, kind of becoming a temporary lobbyist for these issues, calling these like state senators and congressmen, telling them what happened. And not only did it happen to him, it, ha it was happening to a lot of other men in Georgia and around the country of all walks of life, ex-military, police officers, firefighters, doctors, whatever. Guys were getting screwed by this stuff all the time. Right. And Chick is doing it on purpose is to collect a check. So um, as a men's rights activist, he's one of the most successful by far. Usually men's rights issues, like no one gives a shit about men. Right. Well, what, what rights don't men have or what, what why is this necessary? Well, in Georgia, you had no right to sue a woman who financially defrauded you for 10 years mm. for over $100,000. It's like a lot of money. 
Um, other issues would be like divorce laws that are super unfair. For example, Kentucky was one of the first states and now more states have followed suit. They fought successfully in Kentucky for what's called equal shared parenting. That's where when you get divorced, the automatic custody split is 50-50, which is totally like reasonable, common sense basis. Right. But that's not the case in most states. No, that's not how it works. The woman gets a kid like all the time, which is based on like laws and precedent from like 1800s, which kind of ties into how feminism treats men and women today, where men are exposed to be gentlemen from like 1850, right? And women can be super sluts and super whores on OnlyFans. Yeah, modern degenerates. Yeah. I even found uh, yesterday, uh, apparently it wasn't the first time she's in the New York Post. There's a woman that calls herself the hottest grandma in the world. And she sells pictures of her boobs and her vagina on yeah. OnlyFans. Right. She's a grandma. She's a grandmother. Right. What kind of example and, is this for the young women today? That's why it's yeah, the women are so lost, but they have no one to lead them. That's right. They don't have older women. Right. So uh, the pickup artist community, it's, it's pretty clear. Tell us a little bit about yeah. that, because that was your foray into this yes. world, perhaps. Yes. What's the pickup artist community all about as an aspect of the Manosphere? So in my view, it's kind of, uh, I don't know if falling apart is the right word because it's still active in some ways. So basically you had old school pickup artists, which were really about guys and, so, and even before that, the seduction community. In the 90s, you had what was called the seduction community. At some point late in the 90s, 1998, 1999, you had this guy called Mystery come in. He was a guy who eventually had a TV show. He wore like a top hat and he was like six, seven. So it was just like totally standout guy. Cause he was you know almost seven feet tall wearing a top hat and high heels and like all this crazy shit peacocking to the extreme anyway uh from the seduction community to the poa community which are mostly the same thing that was about teaching guys how to get better with women like picking them up whether whatever your goals were whether you wanted to build a family have a girlfriend a same night lay bang a girl in the bathroom at a bar like whatever they weren't really specific about what you're going to do with women it was about getting better with women, improving right. improving yourself, improving your social skills, like your competence with women, your sexual skills, whatever. So they were about that. And a lot of it was very mechanical uh, early on. It was very robotic. They called it social robots. Hmm. I think Neil Strauss famously coined in his book, The Game. So is this where like you learn certain techniques yeah. or pickup lines yep. or just ways to sort of put on so that women will be interested in you? Yeah, it wasn't always like there was always a big divide um, in the in the this wing of the manosphere between like uh, mechanical stuff and like almost pretending fake it till you make it with women. Right. Like kind of ape and mimic like alpha male behaviors um, or even just doing stuff goofy that that you would consider goofy from like a third party perspective. But like mystery, you know, was a tall guy and then wore high heels, which is kind of gay or metro at least, mm -hmm. and then wore a top hat and then wore a feather boa. But he'd walk into a club, you know, even in Orlando, he, he used to come here back in the day and every girl would notice him because he's like over seven feet tall and has a pink feather bow on right. and he's got black fingernails and he's like, I do magic tricks and women are like children. So they're amazed by this stuff. And so a lot of guys in the POA community, uh, they would mimic that or they would kind of mimic some of the techniques and tactics, routines and stuff it was called back then. Right. Or even like seduction models. I mean, it was a whole school. It wasn't a school. It was a whole field of different schools of thought. Eventually you had RSD um, get mm -hmm. going. They're much more like mindset based and confidence based and stuff like this. And so there was always this divide in the PUA community between like direct game, natural game and like indirect and like mechanical stuff. My friend Alan Roger Curry, unfortunately he just died recently. Uh, it really sucked. One of our old speakers. He was always an advocate since the, even the early nineties of direct, 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 direct. Right. He was like the godfather of direct game which I think ultimately is one of the best ways to interact with women, being very blunt, very direct, uh, old school, very manly kind of issue. You wouldn't put on black fingernails and a pink boa. Right, that's boa. more indirect. Yeah. As opposed to just walking up and saying what you want. Yeah. Yeah, and it's very natural and it's very organic too. It's saying what you want, exactly. Mm -hmm. And not trying to play games and put her through some, you know, eight step or nine step process, the M3 model. There was actually, that was famous in the POA community, Mystery. He wrote a book called The Mystery Method um, and then rewrote it later as kind of other titles. He had this model of like A1, A2, A3, C1, C2, C3, S1, S2, S3. And this was a, like a systematic process you would kind of put a woman through to bring her home that night or as soon as huh. you could. So I can imagine guys walking around with like index cards. Trying oh, yeah. To remember. <laughs> yeah. That's literal, huh? Yeah. I mean, it was in a lot of people too. But I bet it worked. If you got decent at it, yeah. yeah. If you're just some social goofball, like, no, these are not 
the dudes would think it's like magic powers, but man, it's going to blow up in your face if you're awkward as fuck. Yeah. But it, at least it got them out of the house. You know, it got mm -hmm. them out talking to women, which I think is the best thing guys can do. If they suck with girls. You should go talk to a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Go talk to a thousand women over the next 18 to 24 months. Right. This will massively improve your social skills and understanding of women, even though you're going to get banged up and maybe some drinks poured on you and some girls going to be like, fuck off or 500 of them are going to be like, fuck off. Your skin's going to get a lot thicker yeah. and your social skills are going to get way more uh, developed at that point. And that's what I did back in the day. I approached like over 6,000 women. Wow. Um, especially early on. I was like a, right. like a machine, like fucking Terminator with that shit. Until you're super comfortable and then it comes natural. Yeah, kind of. It's, there's bumps and bruises along the way. I mean, it's not some smooth development process. But yeah, talking to thousands of women for any man will help you get better with girls. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, terrible with girls in like middle school and high school. So it was very frustrating to me. Like, you know, I was a virgin until my senior year. I did, you know, bang the hot chick on the way out on prom night. But I was still terrible with girls. I was mostly luck. And I knew that. And finding the manosphere, finding the POA community in my senior year high school early on too, like September, October, it blew my mind. It was it was kind of the kernel of self-improvement. Like I could read this stuff on the internet. Some of it is probably not going to work. Some of it's probably bullshit. You know, these routines were even, even as a 17-year-old when I found it, it seemed pretty weird. But fundamentally, I was like, there's definitely going to be some some gold nuggets here I can take and like use and then learn how to get better with girls over time. And even if I make mistakes along the way, I'll learn from that. So anyway, yeah, finding the manosphere was like very eye opening to me, almost from my soul, that I could become stronger and better and more competent with girls. Wow. So it was a great thing for you. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah. I see almost like the seed of the manosphere. And I'd love to just continue going up the trunk and talking about the branches and the fruits thereof. But if, we, if I had to look if, at it, go ahead. If, if we lived in an honest society, you would see an honest and a, in a civilized society, you would see all the time PhD thesis papers and stuff on the manosphere. They'd be friendly to it. They'd be curious. They'd be interested. Right. You do see some thesis papers on it, but they're very negative, uh, you know, very, very yeah. critical of it. I'm into some of them and stuff. Well, it exposes uh, something that has been going on for many decades that yeah. uh, was hope to be kept under wraps or undercover that now when men, I would imagine the internet had a lot to do with it, yeah. began to recognize two ends of this wing, right? So this is, we're talking about the, the, the seeds of the manosphere. You have young men who are confused about how to deal with women because they've been told respect women and to be a nice guy. And, you know, they watch the Disney movies and most of them don't have dads. And so there's this complete lack of masculinity in our culture. And thus young men are frustrated They've lost the, uh, they lost what was probably passed down and told and taught and, and mirrored in their homes with regard to, ch to uh, women that disappeared after this subversion. And then the, the other end of it, are, it sounds like there are these older guys who've done everything that the world told them to do. They get married and then they get screwed. And so it's like, those are the bookends. Those are the two far ends of the spectrum that then began to grow into what we call the manosphere. It was actually, I was going to say the divorce guys is what, you, what you're you saying. It reminds me of, it was the divorce guys who were interested in men's rights. They had serious problems in divorce court that hit them like a, like a train, like the side, you know, the side of the yeah. face. They couldn't believe like how they were treated by, by family court judges, divorce court and stuff. Um, you know, the love of their life for however long, 10, 15 years or whatever, they were married and they would lose everything. Millions of dollars in divorces. Uh, they lose access to their kids. They see their kids, you know, once every other weekend, this kind of bullshit. And women, as you probably know, file like 80% of divorces. So it was these guys, these guys getting divorced. They were interested in men's rights, but also they were like, you know, in their late 30s or 40s or whatever. And they wanted to get back into dating because now they're divorced. Now they're single. So they were, but they had kind of both feet, like in the men's rights and the pickup artist community. And I was not, I was so young, I wasn't too interested in the legal stuff, but I knew that they were consistently telling the same story. These guys that came into like these different groups back then, Top Layer and the Mystery Method forums, all these different like internet forums, they'd all say the same thing, like divorce court's fucked. Like there's serious problems with the legal system for men. And a lot of young guys just didn't really care. Right. And I didn't care a lot, but I cared enough to pay attention. I'm like, these guys are saying the same. There's like a, there's a big problem here. So eventually that's what draw, drew me to what was called the Spearhead back then, a magazine for men's rights mm. and Paul Elam and guys like that. Mm -hmm. And it really kind of opened my eyes, kind of like the feminist bloggers who were studying the manosphere. 
they were also seeing the interplay between, I, guess, I would assume as well, a lot of these divorce guys who were in both fields. And eventually you saw connections, interviews and stuff. Uh, you know, the Spearhead, like I mentioned, was a huge men's rights magazine back then. They interviewed me way back in the day. and It was this big controversy because the 21 convention at that point was mostly known as a pickup artist convention. And a lot of the men's rights guys back then, even today, are very combative against that. They call P PUAs like manginas or pussy beggars and this kind of stuff. Even if even if you just want to get better with women on right. a very basic level, they're like very antagonistic against this. Are these uh, men that are just bitter against the whole idea of being with women? Is that why? Some of them, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but they... even guys I like, like Paul Elam, still do this. Like the other week he was posting this kind of shit, making fun of guys who want to like bang chicks and even just get better with women. Any kind of dating coach thing. And it's right. like, dude. I mean, you may not be uh, wanting to be a man whore, but yeah. you want to be able to speak to women in a way that is attractive yes. and maybe have a, a wife and family, perhaps. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It, well, being more competent with women is nothing but good for your life. Right. Yeah. It should be normal and natural. Yeah. Uh, and it seems that we've fallen so far away in so many different ways uh, that the manosphere, the seed of the manosphere was like a reaction to the ills of our society and can only be good because as men go, so goes society so that's evolved that was your set that was your way into it through pickup artistry and i think a lot of guys uh, would agree would have that same experience and then also the guys that were screwed by the system so we know that there's a problem with the system things aren't going well but then it began to grow yeah. and so you started mentioning a few other aspects of the manosphere you mentioned migtow and and some others um migtow, MGTOW. let's talk about migtow yeah, yeah i really <laughs> want to beat up on them lately sure okay um, they've been a lot more combative than usual and uh, Coach Greg, for example, is someone who I believe used to identify as MGTOW. And a couple of years ago, he kind of got away from that, distanced mm -hmm. himself, and kind of rebranded as his own free agent lifestyle. Right. And I never asked him why, but I, uh, I guess I could, right? I guess text him or something. But I've always just kind of just kept my nose out of it, right? Let him do his thing. Mm -hmm. But seeing how weird and bizarre this little movement has gotten within the manosphere, uh, it's been sad to see. So MGTOW, for example, stands for men going their own way. Okay. And I guess in the 2000s, it was a little bit less radical. It was guys who were just like fed up with women, fed up with divorce court, fed up with our feminist matriarchal shithole society. They wanted to just get away from all this crap. Yeah. But they went so far in the opposite direction that they sound like feminists. They don't want kind of like radical feminists with, you know, this huge pink hat on or like right. 300 pounds. They just want to stay away from women at all or they only bang, have sex with escorts where they have sex dolls. They say you should never have kids. You should never build a family. You should never have a wife, like ever, under any circumstances in the West. And it's not that the there's not very serious issues facing men in the West today, right. men and fathers and boys especially. Um, our society has more problems than that, obviously, but very specific to this. It's that this is like delusional. It's like weeding out yourself from the gene pool on purpose when, in my view, we live in one of the most comfy, decadent times in human history by far. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, you can get screwed in divorce court. Like Je in Jeff Younger's example, your ex-wife can take your kid to California, you know, flee the state to a trans sanctuary state and start surgically mutilating the kid and all this stuff. This is really bad. Like, I don't want to understate that. This, to me, though, is not an excuse to weed yourself out of the gene pool. Right now, okay. I mean, you could go to Starbucks, get a pumpkin spice fucking latte for like $6. You could break your leg on the way out in a slip and fall. You go to ER, you know, you get unlimited medical care for free. Just throw the bill out. You could hire an attorney to get you half a million dollars when you're done. And we have unlimited internet, high-speed internet, computers, technology, uh, unlimited travel around the world. Like, we live in this amazing time in human history. And to say that you shouldn't have kids because the laws suck. They, the MGTOWs, for example, they always say... You know, until the laws change, I'm never dating women. Until the laws change. Yeah. They don't even know what laws need to change, first of all. Right. Second of all, this is an insane way to live. Right. But you're you're going to wait, what, taking, changing laws takes serious time and effort. Carnell eventually just got burnt out, for example. He changed the laws in like six states and he's like, I'm done. Because it's a huge investment of time and money and effort. So what are you supposed to, MGTOWs are supposed to wait 50 years for the laws to change until you're 80 and then you're going to have a kid? Would like you is, say that maybe some of these guys are closet incels? Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. So I, I am trying to figure out what kind of person is in MGTOW. You've got like guys who I would imagine probably just can't get laid, so they're bitter, like sour grapes. Yeah. So it's like, oh, I'm just going to deal with women. 
Um, but then maybe some guys who've been burned before. Yeah. And they're like, I'm, I'm checking out. They're so burnt out that they're like going to highly irrational like conclusions. Yeah. Would you like, say this is a far extreme? One of the far extremes of the manosphere? Um, I would say it's just really bizarre. I don't know if it's extreme. Some of them are extreme weirdos for sure. Yeah, I guess we're all extreme in our own ways. Really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't like. I don't think they're like incels have their own like very specific group that's not part of the manosphere in my view, uh, and that's different from MGTOW where some of the guys just really can't get laid, but they don't want to admit it, or they only bang escorts. Right. Like they call them escort cells is what they call them. Okay. They have all these little names for all this shit. Um, I don't even know. I try to keep up, but even they have so many names of this bullshit they make up. I can't even keep up half the time. Yeah. Even when it's like your job almost to keep up on it. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a weird segment of the manosphere, but every, the red pill, I call the red pill. A lot of the red pill these days are red pill retards. Okay. Um, like I really uh, don't like is, them either. Is the red pill a, a, another part of the manosphere yes. or is that something altogether different? No, it's part of the manosphere. So the red pill came, it kind of hived off from the PUA community in like 2012 or so, 2013. So the PUA community, um, even when I was more involved with it, it became gradually more friendly with like feminism. It became a lot softer over time. Kind well, of really the, the pickup artists yeah. started to show feminist traits. Yes. Mm. It became a lot more, you know, for example, even with like a girl's body count, and even if I had a girl, a girl had a huge body count, they would say, like, don't, you know, shame her for this and this kind of stuff. So a lot of it was just very feminist. It became very soft over time. Um, even big figures like Neil Strauss, you know, wrote the game. He was considered, like, one of the top pickup artists in the world. Uh, these people became, like, overtly friendly with feminists in the media and stuff. So the red pill was a reaction to that where they hived off and were like, no. Like, feminism caused these huge problems in the dating right. market. It's aggressively anti-male and anti-masculine and anti-man, and we're not okay with that. So there was almost like a like a civil war kind of split, uh, which created the red pill, and that eventually became its own pretty big movement in the manosphere, and even still to this day, it keeps moving and around and stuff. So, for example, on the Reddit where the red pill was originally centered from 2012 to 2018, they had al almost 300,000 members in it. It was really active too. Yeah. A lot of guys used to come to 21 convention and stuff like that. Then it got quarantined by Reddit, where it's, it's kind of like a ban. A quarantine means they like uh, silo off the subreddit, a community on Reddit, which is like a big tech company. And it, you can't uh, join it anymore. You can't see who's posting in it. It's basically broken at that point. They killed yeah. it. Um, kind of like if you got shadow banned on Twitter right. and nobody saw your tweets. Well, you can still tweet, but you're tweeting into a black hole. So they kind of killed off uh, that component of the Red Pill Reddit. But then a lot of it moved to like Twitter and YouTube these days. That's where you see guys like Fed and Shit down in Miami, that podcast. I don't like those guys, obviously. Who is that? Uh, Fed and Shit down in Miami. Mm. Uh, Fresh and Fit, Fed and Shit. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Ah, <laughs> so they would be considered uh, Red Pill. A hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, what more about Red Pill that we should know? How can we spot someone who's Red Pill? Is Red Pill a good thing or uh, so I think what's going on there in that faction? Well, the Red Pill obviously comes from the movie The Matrix. Okay. Um, I don't have a problem with... And the red pill is supposed to stand for the truth. And the blue pill in the movie is supposed to stand for lies. This fake reality that you live in. So my problem with the red pill these days is that all these guys who think they're red pill, a lot of it is just like very knee-jerk reactionary stuff. The like, D's hoes ain't loyal and, you know, she's not yours. It's just your turn. Uh, when they say that kind of shit, they really believe this stuff. I think it makes, they think it makes them savage and like they understand female nature. And then I think of guys like you. You've been married over 20 years. How many? 25 years or something? 20. Yeah. You've been married 20 years. That's a long turn. Like, you're probably going to be married to Colleen the rest of your life. So is it really, is she really not yours? It's just your turn? Like, this stuff is delusional. It's very nihilistic and kind of like black-pilled, like very pessimistic. Um, but my biggest thing with the Red Pill these days is that they only look at the first movie to get an analogy from it. Even Tate does this, and I love Tate. Take the Red Pill, take the Red Pill, escape from the Matrix, stop being a slave. So in the movie, the first movie of The Matrix with Keanu Reeves, you take the red pill and you wake up to this reality that you've been living this blue pill lie and you're like a, you're like literally like a battery in this like tube or this like pod you live in, right? In the second movie, at the end of it, it's revealed that even when you take the red pill, uh, you wake up from this like, you know, digital reality that these machines put you in and stuff. Uh, you wake up to this world, but you're still not really free. They think they're free, but they're not. Right. Zion is a scam. The freedom fighters who are fighting the machines, it's all a fucking scam. Neo realizes from the architect, as it's explained to him, 
And then he has to communicate this to his to his friends or in the movie, right, or his partners. It's just another system of control. The machines let them do this kind of stuff because the machines decided it was the best way to manage this small segment of the population that rejected the initial like surface layer lie. So Neo realizes, he's the first one to realize, it's all a fucking scam. They're not fighting anything. The machines come and kill them every 120 years or whatever it is in the movie. And it's just another cycle, another system of control. So these guys who like think controlled they're... Controlled opposition, maybe? Kind of like controlled opposition, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's controlled opposition where the controlled opposition actually think they're freedom fighters. They really believe it. Mm -hmm. And they have every reason to believe that based on, like, you know, people are fighting and dying. But ultimately, the machines know exactly what's going on. They don't really care. And they kill you every hundred... They kill almost everyone every hundred something years in the movie. So my contention is that these guys in the red pill space these days, which is, you know, a big chunk of the manosphere, they take this red pill, they wake up and they realize feminism is stupid. It's all a scam. Uh, it's a really like a hateful movement. Men should be masculine. They get some ideas, right? But they don't realize that they're still living in this like system of control. They're not really free. And that's why you have these guys, they, they support, for example, these simp for what I call red pill hoes. Just pearly things, real femme skanky and her little friend. These are some big YouTubers sometimes. Pearly has like a million fans now. Almost all dudes that simp for her. And they think that they're a red pill because she panders to them and tells them what they want to hear. This to me is pathetic. It's delusional. Like you're not, uh, you didn't wake up from shit. You still, now instead of simping on OnlyFans, you're just simping on YouTube. Right. It's pathetic. So, and the same thing with red pill frauds, uh, all these guys, a lot of these red pillars, Conum and Sharp, for example, Donovan and Sharp. Uh, for the past five, six years on YouTube, he's got almost 200,000 subs right now. He's been making fun of a lot and aggressively, very even more than I would. Uh, single moms, fat women, old women, all this shit. And what did he do? He secretly wifed up an old fat woman who's also a single mom. He used to say that her kid was her niece uh, live on the air. She would even say the same thing. And I have the bankruptcy records, the divorce documents. I've even talked to the father. This is their, her kid. And they've been pretending for five, six years on YouTube to scam guys out of money. And Donovan's propped up by Fresh and Fit, Fed and shit all the time. He's like one of their top guests all the time, right? This dude pretends to be this red pill alpha male who's going to make fun of fat women, old women, and single moms. And that's his real life. Like that's what he lives every single day in but secret. But men are listening to him. Yeah. Because and he's delivering red pill advice. Exactly. He's just pandering to them like a politician. Right. Take the red pill. Be alpha. Be right. masculine. What are surface level like good messages? Like, yeah, be alpha. Yeah, feminism's stupid. Like all this stuff, right? What are some uh, important tenets of the red pill? Like you say that you become free by understanding these things. What are yeah. things that people come to understand in the red pill? The red pill that I don't like or like a real red pill? Well, what's a real red pill? What are some yeah. things that men uh, may stumble upon and be awakened by finding? Sure. So I think, for example, I would go to my friend Pat Stebbin, who I did a podcast with yesterday. That was pretty good. Nice. And he said at the 22 convention, I loved it. He was telling, talking to women, actually, at the 22, right? Make women great again. He was telling them that every woman has an inner succubus, like an inner slut, basically. This is like a legitimate piece of their personality. And the average women will get this. They may not want to talk about it, but they get it, right? The average guy doesn't understand that. He really thinks that there's like, this hard divide between good girls and bad girls and like all this stuff. And on the surface level, you do have these divisions of women across the population demographic. Like I was telling you, there's like grandmas on OnlyFans. Mm -hmm. Most grandmas, at least now, are not on OnlyFans. They're baking cookies and stuff like they should. They're not taking pictures of their vagina because they're grandmas and this is fucking weird. Um, but Pat's point is that every woman has this piece of her personality and the average guy doesn't understand that. Oh, my wife would never do that. She would never do this. She's a good girl. She would never do this. And it's like, maybe she wouldn't, like in your case, Colleen wouldn't do that. But every woman is capable of that. Every woman is a horny fucking animal that wants to get dick down, have a good fucking time and fuck, whether it's one man or 50 men, if she makes bad choices in her life. And the average guy doesn't understand this. Also, I would say a big red pill for guys is that women are very polarized in how they view men. I say, for example, that women see three genders. And I've always said this, even before the gender wars got to like 800 genders. Well, women see three genders. They see women, they see men, and they see betas. Betas are like workhorses to them, like slaves. They just want to use them, get money out of them, shit like this. Provisions, basically. What women consider men are like alpha males. And this is where women say like, oh, he's a real man or he's not a real man. 
So women, I think, are very, uh, on a gut instinct level, they don't think about this. They're not like alpha, beta, like some fucking robot. Right. It's a gut feeling. Like, is this guy in the alpha category, this half of the spectrum? Or is he a beta male who doesn't understand women, doesn't understand me, and he thinks I'm some good little angel with no bad side? Like, this very naive, nice guy, nice guy, or right. nice boy bullshit. So being a nice guy, too, is just terrible. I mean, we can say, you know, he's a nice guy, but... Dude, women fucking hate that. Women hate doormats. They hate guys who pretend to be nice to try to get in their pants. Right. This is an unbelievably bad strategy to have sex with women or have any kind of relationship with women at all. Um, most feminists, for example, feminist men, I call them vichy males. A lot of them are really like sexual predators. They're like snakes hiding in the grass, trying to like blend in with feminists and stuff. Harvey Weinstein was a famous feminist, you know, donating to all kinds of these causes and stuff. Right. So those are some red pills. Um, I could try to go on and on, but basically the reality of women today, because we live in this feminist matriarchal society, they have a huge amount of influence on culture, on how men are conditioned, how men are raised. As you know, all these little boys are raised right. in school. They're raised by single moms at home. They go to school. 95% of the teachers are female. Right. They're all feminists all the time. That's the only worldview they get to see and that they get exposed to. They're taught to be a good boy by their single mom because he's playing like son husband to her and stuff. They go to school. They have to obey, 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 obey. Don't get out of line. Don't be a boy. Oh, you're too active? Here, take this pill. Right. Like really sick stuff. So there's a lot of uh, very negative stuff. We live in a state of real oppression for men today. And no one gives a shit. Or not no one, but almost no one gives a shit, especially in mainstream culture. No one wants to hear it. No one wants to believe it. Mm -hmm. But there's serious well, there's issues. vitriol towards that, even to bring totally. that out. Like, what do you need as a yeah. man? Straight yep. white male. Yeah. The cis hetero, you know, normative patriarchy of, you know, patriarchal pigs or capitalist pigs or whatever. Yeah. We live in real like conditions of oppression. Um, Jeff Younger, again, is a great example of that. He's a father who put a lot of money down, over a million dollars to fight for his son, for his son not to be transitioned into a fucking girl because his son was born as a boy. He couldn't stop that with $1.4 million, even with the Texas attorney general writing a letter for him to the Supreme Court of Texas trying to stop it. Like, this is fucked. This would have never happened in the 1970s or 80s. No such thing. Right. A woman, a mother taking her kid to California to give him, to chemically castrate him. This would have been science fiction, like right. Blade Runner shit. Yeah, pure evil. It's real now. This happens to someone we know, Jeff Younger. Mm -hmm. Like, this yeah. is sick. He's the, he's might be the first, but he's not the last. Right. Like, we're in the middle of a very serious culture war. So those so, are some red pills. Yeah, that's absolutely mind-blowing. So we have, so what basically what we're doing is we're mapping the manosphere. That's why I think we're, attempting here and so we have pickup artists men's rights activists MGTOW and the red pill yeah. what else do we have black manosphere and the uh, tratcons okay uh, why a black manosphere who who's uh running that and how that come about and what's that all about so it's interesting i don't speak for them i mean even as potem president of the manosphere they're like very independent i get along with them i actually like them a lot um, I found the black manosphere to be a lot more masculine than the general manosphere. They call it the white manosphere, which I think is stupid. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of guys who are not white in it. Like this is not, it's not a racial thing. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason though, they decided to create, to carve out their own space years ago. Uh, they called it the Negro manosphere. They had their own website. Even to this day, they run channels for this kind of stuff. In my view, O'Shea Duke Jackson is like the leader of it. He has the biggest voice and the biggest influence. Uh, they might disagree. He always kind of, he's like, no, no, I'm not, you know, this and that. But I call him the governor of the black manosphere. is kind of for tongue in cheek. Um, but yeah, they they for example, when I went after Donovan Sharp with this three hour documentary, you know, line item for three hours, spelling out with facts and evidence, receipts, uh, you know, text messages, you know, confessions from him about all, all these lies he told. Uh, it was the black manosphere who was very supportive of me. They were not because uh, they had any, they didn't like Donovan because they caught him lying years ago before I did. Mm. I didn't even really know. So they had thrown Donovan at, they're all, Donovan's like, I think mostly black or black. They threw his ass out years ago and he kind of went to the general manosphere yeah. and he tried and they, they didn't like that. They're like, oh yeah, he's a sellout, all this stuff. Well, then I threw his ass out too and I exposed him really hardcore, it went viral. It had over 100,000 views in like a month and really did a lot of damage to his business, thank God. Uh, cut his Patreon by revenue by 60% in the first like 15 months, uh, which was his main source of income. I was like really happy to see that. But anyway, they were the ones, a lot of the general manosphere was like, oh, this is clout chasing, so what he lied, drama, blah, blah, blah. The black manosphere was like, fuck yeah, fucking go after that guy, destroy him. 
So they were much more um, they were much more accepting of this kind of conflict, where I was confronting a an issue, confronting a fraud, mm -hmm. and the jail and manosphere was much more like, no, no, let's get along. We got to all get along and sing kumbaya. Yeah. And the black manosphere was like, fuck yeah, I get that guy. Yeah. So I like that a lot, and I thought that that was uh, something that the other the general manosphere should look towards for uh, the action of masculinity. That's what masculine men should do. Yeah. I want to come back to that because you definitely like to point out frauds and I love it. Uh, yeah. Attack them. And yeah. I, yeah, I think it's pretty cool to watch too. Thanks. We'll come back, but so I, I want to dive more into the black manosphere. So who are some of the players there? Uh what differentiates it from say the wider manosphere, I would say? They're very specific about it. Like it's all about black men's issues. Um they can be very combative with white people. Uh, so that's why I don't even know if there needs to be a black manosphere, but since I'm not black, I'm just like, well, if a bunch of black guys want their own space in the manosphere, then go do that. And if you don't, then don't. Uh, as a white guy, I'm not going to get in, in that mix and tell them yes or no that they should or not. Um, I don't think it's necessary. Like they're always welcome to just be part of the manosphere or whatever. Um, but yeah, they can be pretty combative against uh, white people and stuff. So I don't think a lot of them are BLM, but some of, there's definitely like more BLM kind of stuff in there. Um, I don't understand all the issues. I don't take huge interest in the black manosphere. But some of the key players, like I mentioned, are O'Shea Duke Jackson, Obsidian Radio. Uh, I don't forget his full name he goes by, but that's like his channel he goes by. Alan Roger Curry was a big player in there for a long time. Um, there's some more channels too. I don't know all of them. But it's definitely its own little space and it's its own little niche. Kind of like in America, you have like the black community, right? For better and for worse. I'm not saying that there should be, you know, its own, its own distinct uh, kind of thing. Yeah. But they've done the same thing in the manosphere. And whatever, man, go for it. Sure. They they get along with me pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably like the favorite white guy. Yeah. They, they, a lot of them are commenting because there's a lot of smaller channels too that have 5,000, 10,000 subscribers. They were, you saw these black guys, like their jaws were dropping on video watching me go after Donovan because they were like, I can't believe I have to support this white boy in a MAGA hat over this black guy because <laughs> I was just roasting this guy <laughs> like so hard. <laughs> Um, I was like, yeah, I appreciate that, man. Thanks. Yeah. I don't give a shit that Donovan was black, you know, when I exposed him, it didn't mean anything to me. What mattered to me is he was a liar. He was committing fraud and hurting men by lying to them. Right. Um, so I don't know huge amounts about the black manosphere, but it's been around for a while, at least yeah. since 2015. And uh, it's its own space and you know, it is what it is. And uh, the sixth one is the TradCon. Yeah. And that stands for Traditional Conservative. And so tell me about that part of the manosphere that one i'm just kind of like giving a name to it i mean you could also call it like a a fatherhood focus of the manosphere or a patriarchal focus like we've seen with the patriarch convention that i mm -hmm. built um basically i think as the manosphere has gotten older over time a couple things have been happening one is that the movement is naturally uh growing and evolving and maturing uh just as like a movement never mind the people within it just like as an actual entity you could look at and analyze so I think at some point it became natural for a fatherhood focus and a family focus to be more prevalent. And that's what I, when I mean, when I say traditional conservative, that's what I mean. That's kind of like what they're focused on. More religious elements there too, a little more Christians like yourself, Michael Foster and stuff like that. But also as time has gone on, the manosphere used to be predominantly like millennials and Gen X. And the Gen X guys were always a bit older, but the millennials are much younger like myself. I found it at 17 in 2005. So I think over time, millennials have still taken up a huge chunk of the manosphere, but eventually a lot of them became fathers. Uh, like myself now, I'm not a father yet, but almost a father, mm -hmm. father in progress, right? Uh, my baby's due in July, I'm pretty excited. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of guys like that who are millennials and they found the pickup artist community or whatever in like 2005 or 2010 or 2012 or whatever. And they've still kept kind of a distant interest in the manosphere, but over time they've become fathers on purpose, on accident, you know, whatever. So I think that's why you've seen this fatherhood element uh, come into the fray. And also when you, the manosphere is like very, very counterculture. I can't, I can't under, uh, under, overstate that. Mm -hmm. So I think the culmination of its counterculture uh, nature and the prevalence of fathers gave us something like patriarchy, like the patriarch convention. Right. Fathers leading their families, not this co-equal, happy wife, happy life bullshit. Mm -hmm. Who's had a household? The father's had a household, 100%. And that's what I've been trying to instill in the manosphere through the Patriot Convention. And I think one of the reasons I even started that specific event is because family issues became more of an issue at the convention. Not on purpose. I didn't ask anybody to do that. The speakers just started doing that on their own. Yeah. 
So eventually a couple of speakers like Tanner uh, came to me to start a fatherhood focused event. And that's what I did. But I think that is also a reflection of the manosphere. The events are just like reflective of what's going on. Um, I even started as, you know, the women's convention, 22 convention. That's right. And I did that because I think that a lot of men want to bitch about women on the internet. And there's a lot of subject matter to bitch about, right? Mm -hmm. The OnlyFans grandmas, like the endless, you know, super sluts. And uh, it's like Sodom and Gomorrah up in here at this point, right? Yeah. Um, but if you're not going to provide any counter narrative for women to latch onto, how can you bitch? And the manosphere had no answer to that. It was just like, bitch, 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 bitch. These hoes ain't loyal or whatever. And then what? Nothing? Or right. go, go to a foreign country? Right. Like, this is stupid. Like, at least women, in my view, their religion today is feminism. Like this dominates their whole belief system. It dominates their actions over a lifetime. Yeah. And part of the reason for that is they're not given anything else. With a few exceptions, maybe like Mormons out in Utah and stuff like that, women are raised with a strict diet of feminism. Mm -hmm. And if you don't even give them an alternative, how can you expect them to do anything different? Right. If everything on TV and music and movies and books and church and school and university and blah, 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 all of it. Right. It's all cucked by feminism. Yes. So of course they're all feminists. What else would they be? So Make Women Great Again in my event 22 convention that you've been a huge speaker at and your wife. Mm -hmm. uh, that to me is like the first uh, major secular push back against feminism and the culture for women to do better and stop being a bunch of degenerates. I don't know how I got on that tangent, I guess from the patriarch convention, but. Mm -hmm. Well, that's helpful. Let's talk about that. So you're, I've heard you state, or I've seen it stated before, that your mission is to <clears throat> abolish feminism. Yeah. Right. Get rid of feminism. Destroy feminism. That's one mission, yeah. Yeah, that's a part of it. Well, why? What? What is it that's uh, so bad about feminism that it needs to be destroyed? Sure. So I think feminism, first of all, is a toxic hate and supremacist movement. It's the biggest and the most predominant in our culture by far. Uh, we're like fish swimming in water. So everything is feminist, like I mentioned. Every school in this county we live in is feminist. It's all feminist policies, feminist teachers, mm -hmm. at least 80% of the it's teachers. It's hard to even see because we're so awash in it. Yeah, we're drowning in it. So everything in the culture is feminist. The military, the federal government, the state governments, the local governments, the schools, the universities, the churches, all the churches from Christianity, right? Most of them by far are infected with feminism. So feminism, uh, number one, is this very toxic, hateful, and supremacist. It's supremacist for women. And if you even call that out or challenge it, people get mad at you. If you say that it's hateful, and even if you point to you know objective facts and, and statistics, or just women saying they hate men and kill all men and all this crazy shit, or like BLM, right? We're gonna rethink the nuclear family. We're gonna abolish the nuclear family. We're gonna smash the patriarchy forever. They've been smashing the patriarchy for 100 years. What's left of it? It's, it's dust and ashes at right. this point. These people are delusional. And smashing the patriarchy was always bullshit. Right. Smashing the patriarchy meant smashing fatherhood and smashing the family, which they've done. And the tidal wave of millions of single mothers is evidence of that. By the way, all those single moms are soon going to be single grandmas for the first time in, in American history. A lot of them are going to end up in OnlyFans. You know, these ones in the, in the news right now, that's because it's new. Right. In 10 years, it's going to be a bunch of grandmas on OnlyFans. Mm. And that's fucked up and disgusting. Right. How does that help women? It doesn't. It doesn't help anybody. It destroys your country and your culture. So feminism, in my view, also is the most destructive force that we have. So when I say that it's a hate and supremacist movement, what I'm really getting at is that feminism is a super aggressive and super successful attack on masculinity and femininity and family. These are the foundations of any culture. And if you lose any one of these, never mind all of them, which is what we're losing, you're doomed. Your country will die. Whether it's like a Soviet Union collapse, like from the early 90s, or the next fall of Rome, or the next dark age, or whatever, that's what they're after. That's why it keeps escalating, and they get more and more aggressive every year that goes by. It used to be masculinity was kind of acceptable, but we make fun of it. Homer right. Simpson in the 90s, right? Mm -hmm. Big goofball eating donuts, getting drunk and shit. Then it became, uh, you know what, masculinity is uh, kind of toxic. It's kind of bad. Now, and then you get more official. Oh, it's toxic masculinity. Then it's, you know what, all masculinity is toxic. Then it's, you know what, we don't even, men don't even exist. Right. Uh, I have a womb and I'm a man. Like this, this men can get pregnant. Like that's where we're at now. Right. So it's this uh, little boy is like Jeff Younger's son. Oh, he was born a boy, but he's really a girl. Like this is fucking delusional, these yeah. people. Uh, and now we're going to give this little nine-year-old kid, Jeff's son, we're going to give him puberty blockers. We're going to chemically castrate him. You know what? We need to just give him a little snip and chop his balls off while we're at it. Yeah. That is how far the war on men has come and the war on boys and masculinity. Feminism is behind all this. I do think feminism is like the daughter of communism, the daughter of, of Marxism. 
But I think also it has its own momentum and its own yeah. toxicity. There's a definite spirit to it. Yeah, like Jezebel spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, I want to mention too, like when I say that uh, it's an attack on masculinity and femininity and family, masculinity and femininity in particular, this to me is this, the nature of men and the nature of women. And these forces are the most important forces, the most powerful forces in our species. Right. They're older than every single religion. They're older than every single country. They're older, older than civilization itself. They're older than fire. They're older than language. Men were masculine before there was, we could speak to each other, before fire existed, before we could cook fucking food. Feminism is trying to kill that. It wants to zero it out until right. like Jack Donovan would say, we're all uh, androgynous warm people living in pods, which is what they're pushing, right? Get in the pod, put on your VR glasses. Uh, you're not a man. Well, you are a man. You can get pregnant. Women, men and women don't exist. There's 800 genders. This is all Ayn Rand, a philosopher and novelist, she would call it the a cult of zero, that they're death worshipers. These people worship yeah. death. So they want the death of family. They want the death of fatherhood, the death of motherhood, the death of masculinity and the death of femininity and the death of your country. Right. That's what they really want. And if you listen closely to them, that's what they tell you. Mm -hmm. And the death of millions of people. For sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. feminists are the biggest genocidal maniacs in history. They just killed, just in America, never mind every other country on the planet, they just killed 65, 70 million babies since Roe v. Wade. Now Roe v. Wade is overturned, but the genocide continues. Babies are killed every day in America. We, this country is built on a mountain of dead babies since the 1960s or whatever. This, is, this mountain keeps growing and growing and growing. They killed millions of babies. The Chinese, by comparison, only killed 54 million. Uh, that's one statistic anyway from any of the Chinese communists killed by starving people to death. In America, we just committed infanticide. Totally legal, you know, it was enforced by the courts, all this crap. And like, that's just totally normal. We should just forget about that. Saying kumbaya or pretend it didn't happen or that's just right. a clump, clump of cells. It's, it's madness. Yeah. It's evil. It's a cultural war. It's a war yeah. that sort of snuck in and a lot of people don't see it and can't see it. Uh, we didn't see it coming and a lot of people still can't see it today. And I guess that's the best way for the enemy to win. Yeah. And it seems as if the enemy's winning by all intents and purposes. Yeah. Uh, you, as the president of the Manosphere, which is a reaction to all of this. In some ways, yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you see as the solution? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's a huge question because like yeah. I don't want to understate the, the range of problems. Yeah. I want to mention too, um, the reason feminism is so dangerous and it's so, so wicked and so evil is because it's so corrosive to so many forces, particularly masculinity. Yeah. And that's why I think feminism is even more dangerous than communism. Yeah. Feminism is not just some specifically political legal movement. It's much wider than that. Mm -hmm. It's on TikTok. It's on Instagram. It's in your schools. It's in your church. It's down the street. It's across, it's like it's everywhere. Feminism has weakened men in the United States and the West to be less confrontational, less combative, less willing to stand out and, and speak the truth and speak up and to be a man and to be a fighter and to be a warrior. And that's what opens the door to all this other bullshit. Socialism, communism, Marxism, wokeism, all this stuff is, these are all the children of feminism, yeah. in my view. Because if men were masculine, they'd have almost no tolerance for this crap. Right. You, there's, you've probably seen a little picture of it. There's a, I think it's in the fifties, there's a guy in a street, I think in New York, is holding the sign just very proudly. The only good communist is a dead communist. You would never see that in Orlando or in Tampa or any major city in the United States right now. But men have become such effeminate soy by pussies in the past 50 years and now you can't do that anymore. No one would even, almost no one have the balls to do it. You mean you might do it, that's about it. Very, very few men would have the balls to do that. Oh my God, you can't be you know anti-communist. They're just live and let live, brother, just people. Right. So what, they killed 54 million people in China. So what, they killed 37 million people in the Soviet Union. Right. So what, Cuba is a communist shit and kills people. They didn't do communism right. And feminism was what opens the door to like all this crap. And that's why I think it's so dangerous. And a lot of uh, conservatives today and in politics, they don't understand that. They get too focused on whatever the issues are in front of them. They're not focused on feminism and how this affects men and women and children and families and divorce and stuff. Um, there's another part of your question I want to get to, the more recent one. Hmm. Uh, remember the more recent question you just asked? Uh, you ask it again. I don't remember what you're talking I fucking, about. I, I, <laughs> I, went, I went back to the feminism. Are we talking about feminism? Yeah, a minute ago. Well, or, well yeah, then I what is the answer? Really, the my answer. question was the yeah, answer. Yeah, 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 what do yeah, we yeah. do? What's the answer? That, so that's the question yeah, I wanted, that's what I want to get into. Yeah. So 
I think we need a masculine revolution, mm -hmm. a peaceful revolution. I'm not calling for like violence or anything, but we need a total cultural revolution in, in our culture, like by a mile. And the manosphere, that's why I think it's so important. It's, it's the only thing that even has the potential to do this. I don't see this in conservative politics, even MAGA stuff. They don't have that. Uh, and I think MAGA has been a very positive development in recent years. I love it. I'm an old school Ron Paul guy. Seeing Trump get into the White House in 2016 and 17, and then, you know, ever since until he left, uh, that was awesome. Like, that's what Ron Paul was trying to do in 2008 and 2012, was infiltrate the Republican Party and bring the country back in a major way to its founding principles and founding vision, to, to respect the founding fathers and what the country should actually be about, how it should actually operate. So I think, I do think we need a masculine revolution. We need men to wake the fuck up. That's generally what the manosphere is trying to uh, do, get men to wake up, to be men, to be more masculine, to go back to their roots, to respect their ancestors. Uh, and not, unlike MGTOW, who just want to like, you know, basically spit in the face of all their ancestors, they went through hell way, 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 way worse than what we experience now. You know, like I said, it's just comfy. We have Starbucks and internet yeah. and all this bullshit. So we need a revolution. We need a cultural revolution uh, on level with and even more powerful than what feminism has become. And it's a long process. Like the country, I don't know if the country is going to survive long enough for that to happen. It might fall apart. It might. I think what you did was super smart. Move into the middle of fucking nowhere, bumblefuck Florida, uh, getting away from a major city like Tampa and stuff. This country might fall apart in a couple of years. I think World War III is imminent. I think it's going to happen. I think it's naive to think it will never happen. It'll happen probably within our lifetimes, maybe in the next 10 years. Another American Civil War. Our country was founded on a civil war. And what we're never going to have, an, and we had another one 80 years later, and then we're just never going to have another one. The country's just going to go on for 500 years, and there's never going to be in a civil war. This is delusional. So I think we need masculinity, masculine a lot. We need it in, by the truckload, and we need it as soon as possible. And we need men to wake the fuck up. Beyond that, you just need to hang on your ass. You need to take care of yourself. And if this whole thing comes crashing down on our heads, for example, the U.S. is in like 200 trillion dollars worth of debt not this 31 trillion bullshit. It's over 200 at this point, just public debt from the federal government and states and stuff. If this whole thing comes crashing down in our heads, a lot of people are gonna die, things are gonna get really bad, and you need to take care of yourself and then rebuild whatever's left from that with people around you, your family, your friends, and your community and stuff. So I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that, you know, the ship can be turned around, but there's no guarantees and it might not, and things might get really, really bad. The worst we've seen since the Great Depression or even since the Civil War, since the Depression we've seen in World War II, we've seen almost nothing that's been really, like real hardship, nothing. The 70s, oil going up, you know, some stock market crash, the dot-com crash, this is all bullshit. The housing market collapse, right. this is nothing. Uh, World War II, like 400,000 American soldiers died. And the men who came back were fucked up, PTSD, missing limbs and shit. Uh, in the Civil War, uh, 600,000 Americans died, which is a modern equivalent of like five or six million Americans. It's crazy. And then the ones who are left, you know, they come back to their city, burn to the ground, and they're missing a leg, a leg or an eye or whatever. I mean, we've seen nothing like this in our lifetimes. So if that shit comes, this country is not prepared for it, but you need to prepare yourself for it as much as you can and then rebuild from there, I think. How does a man today uh, take up that masculine banner and begin to living, begin living in an integrous way? You need to change what you do. You need to change your actions. I think your actions speak, you know, way louder than words. Mm -hmm. They really represent who you are, what you believe, what you think. Not, you know, the chatter you put on YouTube bitching at me or somebody else or right. bitching about women or something like that. It's what you do. So it's taking bold, courageous action. It's being a man. I, for example, I tweeted yesterday or someone from my company tweeted on the 21 Convention account anyway. I was banned on Twitter recently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we should venerate the founding fathers in this country as a supreme example of masculinity. So that doesn't mean you need to go pick up a rifle and start shooting people in red coats, right? You don't need to try to mimic what they did. These men had massive balls, massive balls, balls of absolute fucking steel to do what they did, to be as patient as they were, to try to work with the king and parliament and all this stuff. And then at the end of the day, pull the trigger and get the job done. And then also, you know, a lot of them had families, they had kids, they had all kinds of responsibilities, things that they built. These things uh, took balls of steel. They took real courage. So you need to live that out, live that way in your life in whatever way that you can. In whatever job you have or career or business you want to start with women, building a family. Like do, I, know, I know a guy in my neighborhood 
uh, he's married and they have no kids and they're mm-hmm. talking about adopting and shit because of like the population, overpopulation, all this like fucking fake bullshit they believe. And that to me is like anti-masculine. Right. Like, no, if you're married, you should knock that bitch up like immediately. Bust some nuts, get that shit done, get a bunch of, make a bunch of fucking kids. Someone made you, not just your parents, but every ancestor before them, took the time through going through hell, right. starving, cold, freezing, disease, war, all kinds of t- real tyranny, like right. real kings and dictators and shit, you know, genocide, all kinds of fucking shit. And your ass is alive because those people went through hell and had the had the courtesy to make your ancestors who made your parents, your grandparents and your parents, you need to do the same. So building a family is a really good start. Building a business or doing something bold and courageous, run for office, fucking do something. Your country's dying. What are some things men should stop doing? Stop lying to themselves. They should stop cowering and not speaking the truth. They should stop being afraid. Uh, Like I said at Jesse Lee's conference years ago, don't be a pussy is some of the best advice you can give yourself. Uh, Very simple advice, don't be a pussy. So if you think something, you think something is true and you want to speak it, you say it. Not this, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job and this and that. Not that that might, uh, that might happen, yeah. Who cares? Stop. Speak it. You think it, say it. Yeah. On the internet, in person, in real life, in church, in your family, at the dinner table, at Thanksgiving dinner with your extended relatives. I don't give a fuck. Speak the fuck up. Stop being a pussy cowering behind uh, your, your fear and intimidation you have by this woke, globo homo feminist culture that tries to dictate to you what you can say and can't say. Like your ancestors fought, they fought and died in America so you could speak freely, right? And they didn't just, uh, they didn't just die. We focus so much on the sacrifice that they make and the the deaths. No, mostly they fought. A lot of them did not die. They lived and they lived with serious PTSD and missing limbs and all kinds of fucking shit. They went through hell. They killed people so that you could fucking speak your mind. And you're going to sit here 200 something years later like, oh, well, I don't want to tweet this because my boss might see it or that HR chick at work. I don't give a fuck. Like if those are golden handcuffs, you put them on. So it's your risk and your responsibility to keep speaking up and speaking the truth. Uh, Free speech, you know, I think is the only peaceful way we have left to resolve issues in this country uh, from its woke uh, doomsday or doom culture that we have going on now where men get pregnant and women chop their tits off and all kinds of crazy shit. Well, you've definitely been vocal and it seems that most of your uh, attacks are within the manosphere itself. There are a lot of times that there are guys that have spoken at your events or uh, people who are highly looked upon in the spe- in the space, but you have no problem poking holes and yeah. figuring out and then voicing your opinion of these guys. Why do you f- feel that that's so important? couple reasons. Uh, first of all, like I mentioned to you before we started, my grandma was a devout Catholic, like really devout. Went to church every week. Uh, she prayed every single night I've ever seen her in my life. Uh, for We're talking like two, three hours a night. Uh, a lot of it was to my grandfather who died of esophagus cancer before I was born. Uh, the rest of it, you know, the rosary beads and whatever else. I don't remember at this point what Catholics pray for. You, I'm sure you know, though. She spent every night just like, like a monk praying out on the patio at her house in the dark, just for the rosary beads and pray, pray, pray. So that doesn't specifically, I didn't specifically interpret from that, be a Catholic. To me, it was the uh, the example of her actions with her dedication to this and her commitment to it and her commitment even to my grandfather. You know, it was, in my view, as a kid, even growing up watching this, it was a commitment to do what was right. She believed this was the right thing to do as a Christian, as a Catholic, and as a woman, and as a widow. It was right to do this and she was going to do it every fucking night no matter what uh, until she was like dying in the hospital at the end of bone cancer at 91 years old. So that to me really imprinted on me as a moral example. And so in the manosphere as an entrepreneur, as a man, as a leader and as a speaker, you know, blah, blah, blah. I always want to do what's right. And I'm always going to do what's right. Come hell or high water. This is a philosophy that was kind of demonstrated to me by my grandmother. And it's one that I've chosen on purpose. It's one that I think is the best for me. It's the best for my life. It's the most rational. It's the most manly. It's the most masculine. You do what's right no matter what. Uh, as you know, I sued a family member of mine earlier uh, last year. Caused a big uproar in my family. Yeah. Filed a civil lawsuit against them to protect some kids, uh, my nephews. This made people really fucking mad. And I totally didn't give a fuck because it was the right thing to do. So when I'm presented with a moral choice, this isn't an excuse to be autistic and have no care for strategy at all in life. But generally speaking, if I'm presented with a moral choice, 
like exposing a fraud who has lied to my face, lied to my friends, lied to my speakers, lied to my customers, lied to their own fans on the internet, that pisses me off. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get presented with a choice. Do I do the right thing or do I ignore this and sweep it under the rug and pretend like it didn't happen or it's not going on now? And I ch the right thing every fucking time. And you've I taken might, a big responsibility of creating a platform for yeah. men in this space. I've created the world's first and only TED Talks for Men that I know of. Uh, the longest running Manosphere event in the world, uh, 26 or 27 events now across five countries and three continents. See, so, yeah, I'm really proud of what I've done. Uh, I don't want to interrupt too much there. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that because yeah. uh, you, you've curated all these men. You have brought them all together in one place. You have a media company that uh, promotes their ideas, even yeah. if you don't always agree with them. That's right. Uh, as a voice for the Manosphere and for men today. And I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, that. That's how you and I came to know each other. And um, what is the f future for the 21 convention and 21 studios? And where do you see this all going? Well, it's, I think it's going to keep getting bigger and better. Uh, my commitment to it every year, like a man for myself, is I want to get a little bit better each year, a little bit stronger, a little bit wiser, all that kind of stuff. With the events, it's the same thing. Each year, I want it to be a little bit more professional. I want it to be a little bit bigger. Excuse me. A little bit better, more professional, smoother operating, better speakers, new speakers, new ideas. Whatever I can do to make it like 1% better or 5% better or whatever, I want to do that each and every year. So we just broke also half a million subscribers recently. I told you I was going to catch you. I'm yeah. going to catch you. Oh, yeah. At least your little channel. I'm losing subscribers every day. On Elliot Hulse? Oh, yeah. Damn. I lost like 600 last week. Wow. Well, <laughs> you, well, you're pissing people off probably. That's good. I lose subscribers sometimes. I lose subscribers every day. I just gain more. These people are like, oh, I'm unsubscribing. You're just a hater. I'm like, get the fuck out of here, loser. You'll be replaced in 10 seconds. Um, we were gaining uh, in October, I think like, do we gain like 4,000 subscribers in a day? amazing so i'm like yeah get the fuck out of here you don't want to be here i don't like you beta male you don't want to hear it these guys so with the red pill stuff taking a step back to it we mentioned earlier that and i mentioned that the red pill these red pill retards they want to like they want to take the red pill they want to be alpha males they want to be masculine but really i've realized that they don't they they're like women they're because they're beta males they want the feeling of being red pill they want the feeling of right. being masculine they want the feeling of being an alpha male they want emotions. They don't want the truth. Right. And when I tell them the truth about these frauds and this stuff, it doesn't matter what I show them, right? There's always an excuse. Like Liver King, right? Liver King, people were saying he was on steroids for years, even Joe Rogan. A lot of those fans didn't want to hear it. No, nah, he's not. You're just a hater. No, nah, it's bullshit. Then he gets exposed. Then he admits it. Oh, well, I forgive him now. Oh, well, people make mistakes. Yeah. It's very similar to the Manosphere. What are your thoughts on what's happening with Andrew Tate? Uh, I was talking to him like the day before it happened. So that was kind of surprising to see his WhatsApp kind of go quiet. And then like, oh, wow, he's fucking, uh, you know, getting arrested and they're taking his cars and shit now. So I like Tate a lot, um, but I'm also under no delusions. And I've known him for years, since 2019, uh, before he blew up in 2022 last year, you know, big time. So I like Tate a lot. Uh, I've got a lot of love for the guy. He's always been a big supporter of 20 Minute Studios. I've interviewed him like four times, twice in person and twice online. Um, Tate's kind of like a cat. Uh, he has like nine lives. So I hope this is all bullshit. I hope it goes away. I hope he gets out of it. Uh, but at the same time, I don't know how many lives he has left as a cat. Uh, this is some pretty big shit he's got into. He's made a lot of enemies. People, I would think, with a lot of money. George, maybe not George Soros types, but miniature kind of George Soros figures, WF kind of stuff. Uh, Romania is not a great country. Um, he had certain, there's certain things to it that he liked. Obviously, that's why he lived there. But yeah, I don't know if he's going to get out of this, man. Uh, I hope he does. And all that. I hope he's innocent. I hope it's all bullshit. To me, a lot of the accusations or the stuff people are lobbing at him sound like disgruntled employees. Chicks that worked for him, you know, years ago. It was like some stripper and OnlyFans or yeah. something. And now they're coming back around like, he didn't pay me. And he said he loved me, but he really didn't. Yeah. You know, mental coercion I was seeing today in AP News and the Associated Press. This is all fucking bullshit. So he's been such an advocate for masculinity, though, and against feminism and this kind of woke global homo world we live in. I think they're taking him out, um, independent of what he did. And I have no doubt he's done some shady shit. I mean, Tate, I've always looked at him like a bull shark, like he's a sociopath. But was, that's why I kind of like him. Like, mm -hmm. I'm on the beach chilling. <laughs> he's out there biting, like, you know, attacking people I fucking hate and stuff. 
He's done a lot of good for the Manister too that people don't know about. He's kind of helped me combat frauds a lot behind the scenes. Uh, two examples I can give, for example, would be Jack Murphy, the cuck, the literal cuck. And then uh, Modern Life Dating, who's a child stalker. Hmm. So he's helped, you know, him and his brother would really, when it really mattered with the fraud, they would step in and help out. And he was not public about this. A lot of people don't know about it. But he was instrumental in combating these kind of frauds. Jack Murphy was a huge one. Easily one of the biggest managers. How was frauds. he involved with uh, that? I'll say that he was, I mean, he's in jail right now. Let's see what I can say. He was instrumental in getting information, uh, key information about Jack to me. And then I got it to some, a bunch of YouTubers that publicized it. So there was kind of like a, like a trail of information that Tate was able to get because he has so many fucking connections. And he didn't know what to do with it. I was like, give it to me. I'll take care of it. So he was very he was very uh, key in taking that guy down. And this is like really sick stuff. Jack Murphy, maybe you remember meeting him in 2019. Mm -hmm. He's speaking at a fatherhood event, uh, the Patriarch Convention in 2019. He was then at the same time going on webcams, shoving uh, metal hooks up his butt. Like this, like like a shark hook, like a big ass fucking hook um, with his girlfriend, now his wife. I think they're married now. And just totally like no, not telling anybody about this, like this big secret he would do for cash on the side is being a cuck. He would have sex with transsexual women. He was peeing on his girlfriend, like bragging about this stuff or doing it on video and selling it, which would give speakers like you pause about speaking alongside him. Like, oh, Jack shoves hooks up his butts. I don't know if I want to speak with this guy. Right. Because you don't support that. And that's like really out there. So anyway, Tate, um, I hope he gets out of it. I don't know what's going to happen. I've always seen him as kind of like a sociopath for money and power, which I'm okay with because I recognize that reality going into the exchange with him. It's like that's who he is. Um, I do like that he's influenced so many millions of people, especially young men. There are kids like eight, 10 years old. They're like, Tate, 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 Tate. I went to a Thanksgiving uh, party out in uh, on the East Coast in Titusville. And there's kids there like 12, 13 years old asking me about Tate. They're like all about him. And I'm like, holy shit, like this is not normal. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a huge figure too, but I don't have like 12 year olds coming up to me like, hey man, you know, Elliot Hulse, like mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. I mean, Tate hit like big time, one of the biggest figures in the world. Mm -hmm. So I think he's done a lot of good. Um, I think he's a pretty good dude. I have no doubt he's done some shady shit just because he's kind of sociopathic. I don't know what's going to happen, man. I wish the best for him. Yeah. He almost spoke last year at 21. We were talking about it right before. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember that. So uh, tell me about 21. Oh, yeah. So you've been holding this event for how many years now? Almost 17 years. 17 years. And it's the, I would say it's probably the first Manosphere event, right? Like one of them. Events like that going on, but definitely the longest running. Yes, by far. Right. And what has been your mission with 21 Studios? So that keeps evolving over time. Make Women Great Again, for example, in the 22 convention, we're an offshoot of 21 convention for all men which was an offshoot of the under 21 convention for young men that I initially founded. So the mission and the events kind of keep evolving over time. I think the Manosphere should basically, and this is where 20th Studios comes in, the Manosphere, I think, has the power to, to change the course of American history. Like changing the future is possible, but it's really fucking hard. Mm -hmm. People underestimate it by a mile. Everybody, you know, I remember years ago, there was a saying like, uh, and then like the mid 2010s when kind of like digital entrepreneurship was really taken off. Like everybody with a PayPal account is going to change the world. It's like, no, you're not. You're not going to do shit. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you'll make a little money. Even that you probably won't do. Mm -hmm. So I think the Manosphere though is a really powerful movement. That's why it has enemies like the feminists, right. and, like Department of Homeland Security and this kind of shit. And I think the Manosphere though can do that. It can actually destroy feminism. It's going to take a long time. You know, even in 2017, I was saying this would take at least like 30 years because feminism is so old from the 1800s and all yeah. this momentum it has and dominance. It's won the culture war by a mile. So, you know, defeating this culturally and peacefully is really fucking hard. But I think the Manosphere can do that. My mission with 21 Studios on a very meta level is to help the Manosphere do that, to keep guiding it forward through time, trying to keep it clean and healthy as we can. It's never going to be perfect. It never has been. There's always been blood sucking frauds, mm -hmm. just scammers. We see an opportunity with a bunch of hurt men who want to learn how to be men because they didn't have a father or the culture tricked them to being a beta male and a nice guy and all this bullshit and they want to get out of that. So I think the Manosphere can do that and I want 21 Studios to be like the most professional uh, organization and event that exists within that space and then keep using public speaking to do that, to help the Manosphere and to help the issues and advocacy and stuff. And I'm the only guy really doing that with speaking and I think public speaking anyway is really powerful like that. 
I think it's a very old form of communication. Mm -hmm. yeah, podcasts like this are very new. Yeah, This never existed before recently in human history. Public speaking is as old as probably like fire. Yeah, getting on stage and talking. Yeah. And I think that that model of communication, like you have a lot of views in your videos, but when you speak, it can go really viral. Because they're not. I think your fans and the internet, they're not used to seeing you on a stage. And even if someone doesn't know you and they see a video of you and it's got 800,000 views from 21 or something, 21 convention, they're curious, like who gave this guy a stage? Right. He's saying feminism's toxic and patriarchy is good. Who gave him? Why is the lights good? Why is the audio good? Like it's 21 Studios. Right. It's the it's the trappings of an organization and a platform that's very real and very professional. And I take a lot of good care of it. Yeah, I work you do. on that. And I think that it's uh it amplifies the communication, it amplifies your voice, and then it it presents kind of like a focal point for these people to get mad at. Like who gave him? Like TEDx would never give you a TED Talks would never give right. you a speech, <laughs> a place to speak, right? Feminism is, you know, evil, the matriarchy we live in, communism is gay, whatever. They're not going to let you say that. Right. You come to my event, you say whatever you want. Yeah. As long as it's not pro-feminism, pro-communism, or pro-racism, real racism. Right. Like, I hate people based on the way they're born, not this, like, woke uh, bullshit. Right. So uh, where can people consume uh, 21 Studio content, uh, join the 21 Studio movement, yeah. come to the 21 convention? and be a part of the movement that the president has started. Yeah. Well, I maybe didn't start it, but I'm um, trying to trying to lead it, trying to move it along. Yeah. And that was frustrating to me when I was young. People weren't leaders in it. Every, everyone just wanted to like do their own thing and not try to lead a movement. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. Anyway, they can go to 21studios.com. Uh, that's our main website. They can go on our YouTube channel, you know, subscribe, join half a million guys. So follow it, 21studios or youtube.com slash t1. They can also go on the App Store. And that to me, you mentioned too, like the future of 21 Studios. Uh, I think we can survive on the App Stores on iPhone and uh, Android. And we're doing really, really good. We're getting over a thousand downloads a month now of the app, uh, which is a lot. We were even getting like uh, almost a thousand in a day one time. Yeah, in October, when I had a video blow up. It did like 12 million views. It was pretty cool. So anyway, go to the App Store on your phone, uh, search 21 University, download it. And that to me is our own app that we own. And even though we don't control the app stores, they can kick us off in theory. They don't really do that for content. So we have a lot more freedom of speech there. And when you guys speak and say shit that YouTube might get mad at, I'm like, well, I control 21 University, so we're just gonna put it there. Go to the app. Yeah, go to the app. And that's our own, you know, it's our own website stuff too. So we have a lot more uh, control over it. And I hate, you know, anything, hate speech, all this bullshit they try to use to silence people. And I don't do that with you guys. Even when I disagree, like you mentioned. Right. I'm not Catholic. I'm an atheist and an objectivist. Well, I think you have good ideas, though, and good observations about reality and about human nature. So go speak them. Right. And people can figure out for themselves what they want to believe and how they want to live their life. That's right. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, I try to use 21 Studios like old school America. Like when Christians would speak in public about stuff and, you know, being a man and being a father and leading your family and all this. Cool, man. This has been amazing. Thanks. And I really appreciate you. I um, appreciate our relationship and I look forward to speaking at your events for yeah. many years to come, dude. Thanks, man. 100%. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency, in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com, fill out an application, and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done.